I'm going to begin now. Uh, I hope everyone is gathered. Lovely to see you if you are. Um, in my first talk, I mentioned how it took me a while to find the women's cartoons and comics in the archives. Historically, the archives is a masculine project and historically, comics is a masculine project. When I did find very many um, women's cartoons in the feminist section, I was excited and relieved. But archival gaps also reflect a centering of white experience in the UK. This is not to say no women of colour were making feminist comics and cartoons, but poses rather a question about the curating of the archive or indeed the archive itself. Whilst discussion around identity was clearly part of feminist discourse during the 70s, the term intersectionality wasn't coined until 1989 by black feminist scholar Kimberley Williams Crenshaw. And I'll talk a little bit about this later in the talk. The research I present is an interpretation of a sample of data collected that shows the interaction of feminism with comics and humour. I offer a history, not the history, which I hope is just the start. Um, to, to begin, I'm going to give you... Oh. I'm going to give you this... Uh, show this slide which gives a sense of how things were being worked out in the 1970s. Um, this is a list of readers' questions that was published in Spare Rib in 1975. What do you mean a women's liberation magazine? But what have lesbians got to do with women's liberation? You're always talking about political change. Why? Why can't you leave that to the people in power? You seem to assume that all women are dissatisfied with their condition. What about women who want to stay at home and look after their kids or like having doors open for them? I highlighted this last one because it links back to my discussion last time about feminists uh, just being envious spoil sports killjoys who are just jealous of um, everyone else. So clearly this list of question reflect, questions reflected complete bafflement around the purpose of feminism. If you see yourself reflected in the status quo as these readers do, in this case as a white heterosexual woman of privilege, then obviously there's no need to ask questions about how society is being run. But if society is to become inclusive, care caring and kind, a recognition and support of difference should surely be a starting point. I'm going to include three areas in my talk today, uh, feminism, comics and humour, and what I'm arguing is that all were infused with a sense of anger. It was Anger was certainly a hallmark of this decade in the UK. Let's begin. The, um, the 1970s referred to a second wave feminism. What was happening during this time? The personal is the political was the slogan of 1970s from Carol Hanisch's 1969 essay of the same title. It introduced the idea of autobiographical or memoir as a way of politicizing and became a testing ground in a sense for feminism. And I think it's still valid today. It was about taking the little things or the everyday as a starting point. And, and, and from that, women were becoming motivated to take action. By little things, I mean division of labor, both in the domestic sphere and the public, experiences of sex and marriage. The idea being that the more that you vocalize and share your experience, which might have been hidden by social taboo, the greater the possibilities of challenging the status quo, which leads to change. And I suggest this strategy still has currency today. How did this take place? One of the distinguishing features of um, second wave feminism was the consciousness raising or CR groups. And this was organized groups of uh, women only groups where women got together and talked and shared about their their, their personal experience and also um, debated and 
planned campaigns and protests and oh and um <laughs> there were there were groups that were networking networked around the uk um the it was started in the usa in the late 60s and responded to the idea that from the left that workers don't know they are oppressed they have to have their consciousness raised and this was applied to women so feminist grassroots activism and direct action came out of this gathering um, what was what was the theory during this time the best sellers so i've just picked a few uh, not all, only Sheila Rowbottom from the UK. Jermaine Greer was arguing that women were rendered eunuchs because they didn't understand their bodies sexually or their sexual desire, desires and was calling for women to educate themselves. Kate Millett analysed the sexism in masculine Western literary canon. Andrea Dworkin was analysed uh, fairy tales and pornography as examples of physical and psychological brutality against women and Sheila Rowbottom showed how from the 17th century to the 1930s women's position and women's equality or inequality was shaped by social influences. Starting then with the personal, I talked last time about how during my research process I realized that I'd been influenced by um, cartoons and comics during my teenage years or early 20s and had sort of dismissed them as um, contributing to my understanding of feminism and indeed my informing my drawing style. Um, I dismiss them because they were just cartoons, but now I realize these things can have as much uh, influence and power on us. Uh, much earlier than that, I had another influence, um, cartoon-ish, which I now realize. In 1968, my mother had four children under five and I was the oldest. She had been trained as a nurse before she had children, and when her youngest child was three months old, she uh, retrained a little bit to become a family planning nurse and went to work in one of the newly opened family planning association clinics in London. She worked part-time evenings. So when my father came home from work to look after the children, off she'd go. And she brought home this lovely shiny poster and it stayed on our walls for probably a decade, if not more. To set the context, in 1961, the contraceptive, contraceptive pill was made available. Um, Mary O'Brien, feminist Mary O'Brien wrote, referred to this as world historical event, because what it meant, of course, that women became equal to men in the freedom to separate sexual intercourse and reproduction. But while this impact was revolutionary for women and men, it also made it clear that sexual liberation didn't always mean women's liberation because it could simply be translated as women becoming more sexually more easily sexually available for men so uh, the debate was really uh coming to uh really uh think that for real equality to be achieved it needed to be within a context of social and cultural change. So I'll come back to this point later during the talk. In 1967, abortion was legalized in the UK. And uh, this didn't mean that abortion wasn't taking place before this, but it was now made legal and safe. Uh, and in 1967, the National Health Service enabled local health authorities to give uh, contraceptive advice through these organizations such as family planning setting up and in 1974 free family planning on the national health service um, and what's also uh, to say before this before 1967 the only way you could get contraception in the UK was if you could prove you were married so by 1974, this had changed. And so by the time I was a teenager, my experience um, of becoming sexualized was already completely different to the one my mother had had. 
what's interesting is how we think of 1967, 68, the summer of love, this hippie, uh, you know, free love, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And this is from the archives in response to that, to the pink poster. The poster advertises family planning. People are asked if they'd be willing to display it. It's a bit gaudy. I'm just not interested. No, the children of six or seven nowadays can read that. So what it reminds us is that most of the country was still very conservative and even a poster like that, it was considered very shop shocking. Um, so uh, these organizations of women gathering uh, formed the National Women's Liberation Movement and in 1970 had the uh, conference where the first four women's liberation movement demands were discussed, equal pay, equal education, job opportunities, free contraception and abortion on demand and free 24 hour nurseries. Um, so already how great that they'd already by 1974 achieved one of the demands. However, this was an example of changing, changes taking place because of government reforms in the UK that benefited women not directly from feminist activity. And such reforms included increasing availability of contraception, improving the welfare state, ensuring entry of more women into higher education uh, than was open to them before and work. Although these reforms supported the feminist agenda, the motivation was not about the equality, gaining equality for women, but um, as Sheila Rowbotham said, served to rationalize capitalist production. The reason I mention this is because it, it may seem small, but I think it's a really critical, well, it is a really critical difference to how feminism developed in the UK. Certainly a lot of influence came from the USA, but there was this, the welfare system and the national health system in, in Britain made it different and as the decades go on I'm going to point out how this directly influenced the making of comics and cartoons. Women only feminist groups were, were making change by leading single issue pressure campaigns. Uh, the most, uh, a couple I've chosen of the most well-known examples was the night cleaners strikes, the Women's Liberation from 1970 to 1972, the Women's Liberation Movement sought to unionize night cleaners who were working in dangerous and low paid jobs. And these strikes resulted in a greater awareness of cleaners who were mainly women working condition. And the other one is the Grunwick Film Processing Laboratories strike in 1976 to 78, the workers striked over unfair dismissals of colleagues, pay inequality and racist company practices. And many of the strikers were working class Asian women. And in 75, the national abortion campaign uh, demonstration held a feminist demonstration attracting 20,000 people who marched to successfully defend the 1967 Abortion Act against James White's amendment bill to make abortion more difficult to obtain. And here's a cartoon, uh, this is uncredited, so if you recognize who did this, do email me later. Um, it's a cartoon referencing the masculine powers at the time from the church, the government and the medical professions making decisions about women's bodies. It was the biggest rally since the women's suffrage campaign and if it had been passed the amendment it would have meant 80 percent of the abortions performed at the time would have been illegal. What was the relationship between feminism and comics? Let's look at some cartooning. Um, my first, uh, I, I divided each decade into my case studies of individual collective and protest and there is some overlap as you'll see and I'm going to start with a protest which I selected the 1970s Miss World protest in London and I recommend the two films I think I recommended them in my first talk as well. The reason I selected this protest was because I came across this small booklet 
uh, by the Women's Liberation Workshop documenting it, and I identified that it included comics, as I'm going to show you. Um, the, the booklet was produced anonymously. There was no uh, names of the people who did the artwork. The artwork is by Jenny Fortune, and the collaboration on the pro uh, preparing this booklet is with Joe Robinson. And this, this non-crediting was in line with the feminist uh, idea that it, of being anti-hierarchical. So there was considered no space for individual egos because that approach was viewed as patriarchal. Another reason I chose this was I didn't see this protest on TV in 1970, but I do remember as a child still, um, a young child sitting watching the, the world Miss World on TV. So there on the wall would be the family planning poster and there I'd be sitting with my brothers and sisters saying that one's pretty, that one's not very pretty, that one's rubbish. And so on reflection as a young child I was already um, learning to objectify women in that way or judge women just on their looks. Another reason was uh, this protest was one of the most spectacular consciousness raising episodes organized in Britain with almost 24 million viewers. It was the highest rated TV program that year and absolutely key in establishing the attitude and identity of the women's liberation movement. And my final reason, and probably most important in terms of my research in a way, it was a protest that was imbued with humor and anger. The two were combined, both in the protest and in the cartoons. Oh no, it's happening again. Gah, it makes me feel so fucking angry. How can we just let that flesh market go on year after year? So why don't we do something about it this time? So this is this idea of women coming together and deb debating. And so what, what, what was the protest? There are around 50 women, some men participating, and they uh, dressed to fit and got tickets to attend the event in the Royal Albert Hall. And in their bags, they had flower bombs, tomatoes, stink bombs, inks, and leaflets. And the idea was that when the signal went off from one of the protesters, they would throw these. The weapons reflected domesticity, and the action had a political theater borrowed from the left. Bob Hope uh, was the compare of the event. Bob Hope was an American is was uh, sorry was an Amer an American comedian, uh, very very popular and well loved. He said, "I'm very happy to be here at this cattle market tonight." No, it's qu no, it's quite a cattle market. I've been back there checking calves. The joke is misogynistic, implying women are dumb animals. This comic skate goating relies on the butt of the joke and according to the superiority theory of humor which I introduced last in my last talk this is a humor that's aggressive and hostile it's a humor that functions to reinforce a consensus not to criticize in any way an established order or to change a situation in this case hope's jokes were supporting a social acceptance of the sexual objectification of women that played, also played into deeper structures of sexual and gendered power. Uh, theorist Francis, humor theorist Francis Gray says, comedy positions the woman not simply as the object of the male gaze, but of the male laugh. In other words, puts the woman not just to be looked at, to be laughed at as well, doubly removed from reality. And here we see the feminist visual retaliation. And this is again what I talked about last time, this reversal of the superiority. Bob Hope becomes the butt of the joke. The sweat drops are shown, showing him out of control. He's hot, but not in the right way. He's leaky, degenerate, desperate. The caricature is of his sexuality, displaying it, displayed and shamed, his phallic nose, his testicular nostrils and wilting microphone. It's this monstrous physicality that's drawn, that's juxtaposed with the small woman 
slightly at an angle, <coughs> sort of in reinforcing her inanimate position and almost like a cardboard cutout doll objectified. Bob Hope's uh, jokes generated absolute hilarity from the audience, but made the protesters so angry that they let the um, let off the sign for everyone to throw a bit early. Uh, the protesters were assaulted, arrested on assault charges, and I really like this bit above. Uh, Maya was arrested for abusive language, telling a pig to fuck off. Um, so they were then um, went to trial, which was the first women's liberation, British women's liberation trial since the suffragettes. And here we see the heavy black shading denoting the women protesters reclaiming the power. So at the forefront of the panel, we see the symbol of power, female power. The judge is caricatured as a bulldog using the tr tradition of physiognomy. By positioning him as an animal, this is reversing the direction of the hostility, mimicking the joke that Bob Hope made um, about uh, women, referencing women as animals. He, the judge, is at the top, yet you can only just see his head peeping over and it's, he's drawn, clinging on to the side, sweating again, he's out of control. And uh, reading it as a comic, we can see the text moving in different directions, but there's no speech bubbles. So it's this sense of disorder, of chaos. This was then an example of comics used in feminist protest. Interestingly, what isn't considered in the booklet is certainly is the anti-apartheid demonstration that was also taking part at the same event. Another detail was that the winner was the first black Miss World, Miss Granada, Jennifer Hostin, and the runner-up was a contestant from a black woman contestant from South Africa, Pearl Jansen. And this, what makes the debate quite complex, I think, is because for those women, winning absolutely transformed their lives. So although the protesters weren't protesting at the women directly, but at Mecca, it's still something that was more complex than it may be apparent at first. And certainly it's absolute evidence that there's no such thing as a sig single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. At the same time, there's no single definition of woman. And the main criticism of the second wave feminism of the 70s was an implied assumption that all women are the same, which was criticized as an implied assumption that the same means white privileged heterosexual. This was being challenged because um, within feminist debate, it was being challenged and debated. For example, if you're a black or lesbian or disabled or working class woman, your experiences of being a woman will be very different. The argument is that different forms of discrimination or oppression will intersect. So introducing what became, no, became known and termed as intersectionality and is perhaps we're more familiar with now. The debate was going on in the 70s. It was just, I think, working itself out to become a term. Um, turning now to what was happening in comics, in mainstream comics, there has been a lot documented on um, British comics history on the mainstream. So I'm going to skip this by uh, signposting uh, Roger Sabin's history as a comprehensive and accessible survey, and certainly to complement it with The Inking Woman, which I co-edited with Kath Tate. Um, and I am also going to say that there certainly were women cartooning and comicking with successful careers throughout the 70s before and after um, who never experienced any form of discrimination based on their gender and were 
publishing regularly in the national papers and also periodicals such as Private Eye and The Spectator. So these include Merrily Harper, Sally Arts, Rihanna Duncan and Ros Asquith, most notably Posey Simmons. These women have not been the focus of my research. And so by signposting you to the inking woman, certainly these women's works are included in there. My, in my research, I was more interested in looking in depth at a few comics. From the end of the 1960s, the British mainstream comics industry was in decline. However, there were three successful titles that emerged from an alternative counterculture that was happening in comics with um, different characteristics to more traditional comics. They were anthologies, they were targeted at an older reader, and they were aligning themselves more with magazines than comics and influenced by 1970s punk. Perhaps most famous of these was 2000 AD, a weekly comic uh, created and first edited by Pat Mills, serializing stories of science fiction, fantasy and violent satire to address questions of state power, racism and imperialism with a punk tone. Um, one of the characteristics that these new uh, titles also shared was, although they all align themselves with a radical politics that challenged existing social structures, they, they didn't really seem to include feminism as part of that, and they didn't really seem to provide any opportunities for women cartoonists. 2000 AD didn't, AD didn't have any women contributors in the 70s, but they did have a few in the 80s and 90s. Following the success of 2000 AD, um, the, the next year Mills launched a comic for girls because they generated greater sales. So this mirrors the finding of uh, Trina Robbins in America and uh, Mel Gibson in this country that there was a really big audience of girls for comics. Um, that uh, on when it sold, when it was launched, it sold approximately 270,000 copies on launch. Still only a few women involved in production, including Angie Mills, Melinda Gebby, Hilary Robertson and Rachel Pollock. And finally was Viz, a photocopied alternative zine produced originally by two brothers in Newcastle. By the end of the 80s, it was one of the biggest selling magazines in Britain. The object objectification of women and marginalization of women in these so-called alternative mainstream comics was noticeable. A lack of recognition of what feminism was about and of, and a, uh, misunderstanding really of sexual liberation in the 70s. However, there was another platform at the time for comics and cartoons, which was the underground or counterculture alternative press in Britain. And here, here's some of the main uh, titles. From the 60s, this idea of counterculture had emerged, infused with left-wing pacifist ideas, popularized by drugs, rock and roll and free sex. This is uh, the front cover. Sheila Robotham was uh, an editor member. This was a Marxist newspaper, Black Dwarf. And in 1969, she included, published an essay uh, in the issue. And she recalls much later her response to the cover, which was designed by Martin Sharp, who she writes had heard women and thought ridicule. She writes on the pink cover, a cartoon dolly bird looked out from a V sign holding a hammer and sickle. Below the image, he had drawn a woman in a boiler suit in comic book style, her pocket buttons substituting for protruding nipples. Women's liberation, she writes, in the designer's mind, seemed to evoke everyone taking their clothes off. It was this misrepresentation of sexual liberation and feminism. It was a way for young men to blackmail 
women into sleeping with with them this is a quote this is uh, richard neville chicks were told uh chicks as no richard richard neville journalist called them chicks women were told they were conservative warring or if they refused male attention this returns me to the point about the contraceptive pill although it should have been liberating it did not mean we were free to discover our own sexuality but rather that we were expected to behave according to male notions of female sexuality this uh this misinterpretation had been experienced by the american women's comics and it's what motivated them to produce their own publications nicola lane was the only woman cartoonist for international times her very successful beryl in peril strip was based on the original lineup of characters Dennis the Menace, Beryl the Peril, and other characters from the Dandy and the Beano comic, but representing them in this strip as radical adults. Her cartoons were funny and carried a feminist message. <laughs> and another notable contributor to the British underground comic press was Susie Varty as part of the Birmingham Arts Lab. So the Arts Labs were um, experimental uh, platforms that were dotted, springing, emerging around the UK. And this was Birmingham where um, they had formed in 1973, they had an in-house printing press, hand built and operated by cartoonist Hunt Emerson. And cartoonist Susie Varty was the only woman member. She contributed to street comics that Hunt did and later edited the first British woman's comic heroine in 1978, as well as contributing to a huge amount of uh, anthologies and, and other uh, comics works she produced. Unrecognized within the so-called alternative press, feminists were building their own strand of publishing. Um, and here this fits in with my most important finding was that feminist publications were where platforms for women cartoonists comic and comics were being formed so around the country feminist organizations and groups were printing newsletters and magazines because this was a way of circulating information gathering support for campaigns and offering education all of this was a form of consciousness raising uh, newsletters were distributed at local women's liberation move, movement meetings and conferences so shrew, most of them, many of them included co comics and cartoons. Shrew, published by the London Women's Liberation Workshop. Uh, Wire was also the National Internal Women's Liberation Movement newsletter. And the biannual Red Rag was produced by a collective of Marxist feminists, members of Women's Liberation um, Really, the most important and biggest platform, certainly for cartoons and comics was Spare Rib. Started in 1972 and running till 1993, started by Marsha Rowe who had worked at Oz and Inc and Rosie Boycott who had worked at Friends. So both of them had worked previously for the alternative press and both of them were very frustrated at the restriction of women's roles within that um, contributions to this so-called alternative. It wasn't alternative for women and it was that which spurred them to start Spare Rib, run as a collective with 10 full-time, five part-time workers. They were interested in a publication that expressed a critical dissatisfaction about women's experiences and assumptions. So the intention with Spare Rib was to provide a notice board and a journal. It was a form obviously of consciousness raising. By the end of the 1970s, around 27 women cartoonists had been featured. So every issue from 72 till 93 uh, included cartoons and comic strips by women at some point. The same year was the launch of Cosmopolitan. 
Uh, now, the national magazine company spent £127,000 on the launch of Cosmopolitan, and on the first day, it sold 350,000 copies by lunchtime. Spare Rib launched for £2,000, raised through donations, and the first print run was 15000 So you couldn't um, have a starker contrast, this glossy women's uh, cosmopolitan and this uh, very much cheaper, pr cheaply produced uh, publication. But actually, Spare Rib, surprised, perhaps surprisingly, held its own 10 years later with a circulation of 35,000 and an anthology published by Penguin. Oh, I want to talk about mainstream humour in the 1970s uh, to introduce you the, to what was happening. In, by the 1970s, w working men's clubs and institute union had become an established part uh, in the north of England, providing entertainment for working class men, which included live performances and comedy acts. Um, the aim was for an immediate reflex response to the humour. To do this, it relied on misogyny, racism, and ho homophobia for an easy laugh. Women were scarce in the programming and uh, were simply there to be the butt of the joke, which proves that humour and a sense of humour is not innate, but is culturally determined. So Spare Rib recorded protests as part of its um, you know its content of the of the of the magazine and also examples of this misogynist humor and uh, i really enjoyed the shot i mean with shock and absolute disbelief coming across this image in a 77 1977 spare rib um the reason it was included was because uh, it was some underpants. It says, your friendly neighbourhood rapist. And it was stocked in Tesco and at a Catford branch of Tesco in South London, a group of women picketed the shop, collecting a, signatures on a petition to have the underpants removed successfully. Um, the image then depicts a white... I, I was... I, when I saw this image, thought, ah, oh, great, that is definitely cartoon. I'm, I can include that. It depicts a white middle-aged male, unshaven, the stereotypical flashes Mac and tri Trilby that also visualizes visual signifiers of the working class man. So this insidious implication is that all friendly white working class men are rapists. If we read the socks as the stripes of prisoners' clothing, there's a further pernicious insinuation being made that working class men are criminals. We see the rapist running, but he's not being caught. I think the most chilling is the frightening message that not only do rapists not get caught, but this chilling reality of most rapists known to their victims is what makes this cartoon so disturbing, the, the, the friendly and rapist. Um, so I invite you to consider, would this pair of underpants be considered by Tesco if it had a photo of Peter Sutcliffe above the friendly neighbourhood rapist? So, uh, dubbed by the press the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe murdered 13 women across Yorkshire between 1975 and 1980. The case was mythologised by the media and introduced a climate of fear for women. Joan Smith, in her book Misogynies, published in 1989, in which she writes about the case, notes, misogyny wears many guises, revealing itself in different forms, dictated by class, wealth, education, race, religion, and other factors. But its chief characteristic is its pervasiveness. And I argue that humor and cartoons were part of this pervasive guise of misogyny. Uh -huh. 
And here's an example of a cartoon from a 1977 issue of Police, uh, which was a magazine of the Police Federation. And we see three judges, the highest level of, you know, high level uh, legal men, uh, sort of admiring the behavior of the rapists. which illustrates uh, what Angela Phillips said, although it's against the law, the glorification of rape is built into our culture. And um, American feminist poet Susan Griffins, Griffin wrote, rape is held to be natural behavior and not to rape must be learned. Um, following this, Reclaim the Night in 1976 took part by women coming together to march in response to the mishandling by police and media to the Sutcliffe case and the curfew that was imposed on women to be home by dark when, the femi when feminists were arguing, why is the curfew on women? Surely it should be a curfew on men. In Leeds around this time, my next um, case study I'm going to look at today is the individual and I'm looking at the work of Jackie Fleming. Jackie Fleming was a student of fine art at Leeds University during the 70s and in her final year she was taught by the British art historian Griselda Pollock who introduced her to feminism. She submitted an essay to Pollock in drawn form which Pollock suggested she sent to Spare Rib and this drawing was uh, included in a double page spread in 1978 issue. I'm just actually forgot I must signpost this is Jackie's most recent book, which I highly recommend. And this is the cartoon strip. The comic begins with the image of a young girl, which during Fleming's career, she developed to become her most recognizable recurring character. Um, using the drawn lines of scribbly and scruffy, showing the little girl getting up, her hair is unkempt, showing innocence and youth, but also a cheekiness. We see the second scene, the girl looking at the billboard advert. A photograph of a woman's face looks out from the billboard. She looks beyond, not at the viewer. She's not interacting. She's looking out to be admired as the idealized woman. The stereotype is the eternal feminine. She is the sexual object sought by all men and by all women. Virtue is assumed from her loveliness and her passivity. The sequence continues with the little girl putting on makeup. The message then is the influence of young girls, the influence of the media and advertising on young girls. The girl positions her, takes off her clothes in an incongruous setting. She's now in an art gallery. And um, we see her positioning herself naked. Um, and we enjoy the absurdity of this, reflecting on how so many work of art, works of art in galleries and museums are of female nudes by male artists. Fleming's protest in her cartoon strip is against high art then, as well as advertising. This implies not only a comment on gender, but also on race and class. The final tier shows the legs of the guards dressed, standing over this tiny naked girl. And the scale not only adds to the violence and anger of the image, but also the incongruity. The booted legs of men are big and the vulnerability of the small girl. And we see them dragging off the, carrying off this girl as a danger. And yet Fleming's point is all the little girl is doing is what she's supposed to do in her quest to become a woman. She's imitating visual representation of the idealized woman, not only presented in advertising media, but also in the gallery. So the last panel is the punchline of the cartoon. In my first talk, I referenced this visual link of um, uh, Jackie Fleming's little girl to the vote girl used by the suffrage atelier. So this was a subtle and humorous reference by the suffrage, suffrage atelier to the legal state of women at the time, which was equal to those to that of children. And it's also a representation of feminists as playful. 
Um, I also found a similarity in Jackie Fleming's little girl to Eloise, who was a young girl cartoon character with unkempt hair and precocious ways, created in the 50s by Kay Thompson and illustrated by Hilary Knight. It was a, became a series of children's books. So it's about Eloise, who's a young girl who lives in the Plaza Hotel in New York with her pet pug and pet turtle. She speaks with the language of the adult socialite. So this merging of adult and childish behavior is what produces the humor through the absurdity and incongruity. While Eloise invites re reflection on and critiques the absurdities of um, upper class socialites. So is a comment on class. Fleming, Fleming draws attention to the absurdities in the way women are viewed socially. Uh, so the humour can be understood with reference to incongruity, which needs to be resolved before it can be funny. And an inspiration from, uh, of Fleming, of Jackie Fleming, was from the cartoonist John Glashan. And he wrote, I've discovered that the nearer humour approaches seriousness, the funnier it will be. Being funny is not funny. Humour is seriousness in disguise. And last time I talked about how something can be humorous, but not necessarily generate a laugh. So here we see, what do you want to be when you grow up, little man, an alcoholic like you? And here's Jackie's, and what are you going to be when you grow up? Horrible. Making men's violence visible was a crucial aspect of early feminist work. And again, this is something that has been done in comics and cartoons by women. This is a, a drawing Jackie Fleming did and produced as a postcard photocopying, and it sold very quickly. It was based on an experience of her being attacked on the way to work. And when she arrived at work, her colleagues saying, well, what do you expect if you're wearing earrings like that? So it was her absolute disbelief that she could be uh, held responsible for, for, you know, having violence imposed on her. At the time, this is in the 70s, there were lots of self-defense classes being held and there really was a belief in the power of self-defense as an answer to male violence. <clears throat> I, I do, um, I, I attended quite a lot of uh, these classes and they were considered great for gaining confidence and control. It's the idea that the woman isn't passive but is in a position to fight back. The First Rate Crisis Center in Britain opened in March 1976 and in its first annual report a year later stated Self-defense classes have always been an integral part of our scheme, and this cartoon satirizes that. In 1974, feminist Angela Phillips noted the first thing police looked for before pressing a rape charge was signs of a struggle as evidence that women has put up a fight for her virtue. But actually, it was worse for a woman to struggle as violence was met with greater violence by perpetrators. Um, I remember the confidence that I felt uh, knowing some very basic karate and judo moves <clears throat> until a friend's mother pointed out that what if the attacker has a knife? I wouldn't be able to fight back on every occasion necessarily. In 1973, uh, oh, oh, there it is at the bottom. Um, Maggie Lomax said, to learn defense is like accepting their system, entering into their violent world. She said, what, when what we are surely striving for is birth, life, love, where one shall not dominate over the other, most of all physically. Um, Jackie Fleming's cartoon visualizes the anger and violence women feel about women, about men who attack. Um, relying on the reversal superiority theory. At the same time, it incorporates incongruity because of the cute little girl. And also the idea that the female fight is a neat parceling of the attacker rather than a bloody mess of the floor. <clears throat> 
again, when Jackie Fleming produced this uh, postcard, the relevance, remember the relevance of Peter Sutcliffe in Yorkshire, because Jackie was living in Leeds at the time. Um, on to my final case study of the 70s today in my talk. I'm going to look at the collective and there is an overlap because um, we've talked about a lot of, I've talked about a lot of organisations already that were collectives. And collectivism of women's experiences was a core essential part of feminism in the 70s along with consciousness raising. The collective was viewed as a way of sharing work, allowing women to gossip and share ideas and thoughts that could influence what they did. It also provide a, provided a solution to the isolation of the family within a capitalist structure. Historian Tema Kaplan writes, it was through na women's neighborhood networks that political action groups were mobilized during the mass textile industry strikes in Barcelona, Spain in 1913. And um, my case study was on this, is on the Sea Red Women's Workshop. And again, this is a fairly recent book they brought out, published by Four Corners, a beautiful um, book of their posters that they produced. Formed in 1974 and continuing to run until 90, it was formed of a core of core group of three art students after they finished. Prue Stevenson, Susie Mackey, Julia Fiang, uh, mm, sorry, and Sarah Jones. Um, they advertised in Red Rag, which was one of the periodical, the publications I referenced, for others to join the group. They wanted to look and combat the negative images of women in advertising and the media. So um, what's interesting, again, we can link back to the suffragettes. Uh, the, they worked as a collective. They worked with um, producing screen prints. They made everything, all, all the screen print, um, equipment themselves and they traveled to the conferences and protests with their screen printing equipment. Um, so there's similarities, there's similarities also to the Women's Liberation, uh, Women's Liberation Workshop who also by the way made screen prints of leaflets and posters because they didn't include names in their, in the Sea Red Women's Workshop also didn't didn't credit the works it was seen as a group effort and i remember them at a talk saying um how their uh, fellow arts men who they'd been at art school with were really quite horrified by this that they weren't putting their name to it and also that was the reason for the um, suffragettes to produce images was to combat the negative uh, a pictorial protest Form of pictorial protest. Um, and the important focus of their approach was domestic issues. As a collective, a <coughs> part of their activity was also sharing childcare and um, as well as working together. Uh, they lit their first, their first place where they worked was a squat in Camden Town, and they had. Uh, they put a poster, probably not dissimilar to this, I, I don't, I'm not sure which poster it was, and the next day a brick was thrown through their window. So this was in 1970, when, 1974, so it doesn't seem anything to us now, but was considered really quite a threat to people to be, you know, engaging with feminist ideas. This poster reflects the, w, the Women's Liberation Movement demands in 1970, which I already referenced, there were four. Two, two more additional demands were added in 1974, a legal and financial independence for all women and the right to a self-defined sexuality and end to discrimination against lesbians, with a further one in 1978, freedom for all women from intimidation by the threat or use of violence or sexual coercion, regardless of marital status. 
and an end to the laws, assumptions and institutions which perpetuate male dominance and aggression to women. Um, I've selected this poster to talk about because it encapsulates the feminist debate around work in the 70s. I'm going to go into some careful looking at this now. It references division between paid and domestic work. Red, the use of red ref reflects the protest element. And actually, the Sea Red Women's Workshop called themselves Sea Red because of the anger they felt about the issues they were responding to. So again, this, uh, this recurring anger. And by the way, uh, they were art school trained. They, when I um, approached them and, and talked to them, they, there was no way they saw their work as comics. It's my reading of their work that sees this image, for example, this poster as divided into two panels, the boxes we refer to in comics. Um, and the split, the woman is lit in the middle is literally split down through the middle. She's a split woman who has to work a double shift. The unpaid domestic work in the home is depicted on the left as mother and wife and on the right, the paid employment on the right as unskilled factory worker. Um, and if it's read as a comic with the line down the middle, there's no gutter, which is what we call the space between comics panels. And this signifies the lack of space, the butting up next to each other. There's no distinction between women's work roles. The, the, the feminist debate on domestic labor in the 70s was concerned with the relationship between housework and capitalism. The point that the Sea Red Women's Workshop wanted to make was that the capitalism, capitalism and the capitalist boss benefited from both forms of women's work um, depicted here. In other words, by not being paid for housework, wives were contributing to the capitalist reproduction. That is to say, if the husband had to pay for housework, he would expect an increase in wage from his workplace to, to go towards this, which would reduce the profit, profit for the employer. In my analysis, the next bit, I'm going to draw on feminist film scholar Laura Mulvey's idea of the male gaze, a term she made famous in a seminal essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema in 1975. Laura Mulvey looked at how men and women were represented in mainstream Hollywood film and she talked about how an ideal viewer was constructed. This term, the male gaze, she argued, was achieved when three views were from the perspective and for the pleasure of the heterosexual male. These views were firstly the view from behind the camera, secondly the view from the audience, and thirdly the view between the characters in the film. These views are all seeing but unseen and in that way control the woman or control how the woman is represented. Applying this idea to capitalism and the ideal working woman, I'm referring to a male orientated capitalist gaze in my analysis of this image, this poster, achieved when three views of the worker were for the perspective and pleasure of first the view of the employer. And if you look at the right, of the image at the top, um, you can see that looking through the window from outside, so from the public sphere into the inner sphere, which is the factory, um, the capitalist boss is signified by his bowler hat and the money sign on it, the pound sign. He looks into the, the inner space of the factory. He is seeing but unseen so he's keeping an eye on the workers secondly is the view of the husband on the left we see the husband in the armchair in the private family sphere he's watching tv where the media message of the idealized alluring woman just as the billboard poster that jackie fleming's cartoon displayed is is looking to be looked at she's smiling out from the screen Meanwhile, 
the half of the wife in that domestic scene is depicted as blending in with the furniture. She's invisible, signifying and reinforcing the invisibility of her unpaid domestic labor. So as part of the capitalist production process. And thirdly, the view of the audience, or in this case, the view of the wider processes and relationships of capitalism <coughs> is represented. You can just see the man looking in into the domestic view from outside, from the window outside the public sphere, again, into the private sphere. This time, the inner sphere, the private sphere is the, is the home. And um, uh, from, at, from the outside public world, he's looking in at the ideal household. So from outside, the, the household and the family is ideal is the ideal setup. It's also ideal as supporting capitalist production. In 1974, British feminist Anne Oakley published Housewife, based on her research into attitudes of housework in Britain, which showed that housewives experience social isolation, loneliness, and social anxiety. If we go back to look at the woman's eyes in the middle, we can see they reflect this. She stares expressionless out at us, her eyes shadowed with tiredness. Um, and Oakley identified a sense from women interviewed that they ought to be satisfied with dreary work. And I remind you of um, my discussion in my last talk about uh, the language around and ideas around happiness and that by questioning it, that the feminist is positioned as the envious killjoy spoiling it. And so there are terms we talked, I talked about last time of domestic bliss. And another word that sometimes is used in this way that we should aspire to be natural and like happiness, it, it makes me feel a bit, uh, my stomach tightens when I hear this word natural, that it's natural for women to have children and to care for them. And what happens like with happiness, it becomes, it seems to become conflated with the naturalness of parenting or childhood care to become naturally, uh, um, the woman's natural role is to include housework. That is, it's natural for a woman to clean and shop. And Oakley proposed that um, the liberation of housewives could be achieved with abolishing the housewife role, abolishing the family, and abolishing gender roles. In 1972, the Wages for Housework campaign was really a consciousness raising activity by feminists because if domestic housework was formalized in this way to be paid for, it would simply reinforce women's undervalued work. And um, I added this because I, as I'm, I was preparing this again, rethinking, I wonder how much it really has changed. And a friend who was uh, studying towards her PhD at the same time as me, Zoe Young, has published her research now. She was working, uh, researching quite high up executive women and, and identified that still if they're women within a family in a family setup and still it was those women where there were children or even without children who were having to organize all the domestic even if they weren't doing it themselves so it's still um, an interesting division of labor certainly the sea red women's workshop poster doesn't propose solutions but it does position us the viewer in the private sphere and directly invite scrutiny of the bigger picture with the collective and from the feminist viewpoint. So I'm going to come to my conclusion really about the anger of the 70s, that feminism uh, introduced strategies such as the um, consciousness raising and collectivism and uh, looked at the everyday to challenge ideas about what equality is and could be. And the comic form was used with, with humour to do this.
and comics, feminist publications, again, I say, provided platforms for women comics and cartoons that the so-called radical alternative counterculture did not provide those platforms for women, misinterpreted the sexual revolution and misunderstood and misinterpreted feminism. And finally, humor, a new humor, challenged what funny was and decided what is funny. And this deciding or challenging humor was included in cartoons that were produced. And I'm just going to end on um, this poster by another poster by the Sea Red Women's Workshop, which is a way of segueing into my next talk, which will be about the 1980s in the UK on the 20th of July, 